Okay, we're going to get ourselves underway. Uh, good morning, everybody. Just to let everybody know that we've hit the record button. So the webinar, as well as being live, is being recorded. Um, so I'm going to keep the introduction very, very brief. This morning, excuse me a second. I'm going to keep it very brief. Um, my name is Kevin Page from Strathclyde Business School. I head up the Centre for Digital Transformation. And I'm delighted you can join us today for a fascinating session. My involvement with the CCA goes back more than 15 years. First of all, as a client, when I manage contact centres, and then today, uh, supporting the excellent work they do on futures and scenarios. Today, though, we're continuing to work on the industry reset theme. We know over the last 18 months, we've seen an incredible acceleration of digitization and enforced changes in operating model, including the idea of a physical contact center model. So the big questions we're asking is, what's next? We've got an opportunity to affect real change as we work together towards the post-pandemic future. In a way, you could say the roof is off the house and we've got a chance to move the walls and better accommodate shifting requirements for both businesses and for customers. And what we're hearing from members, from networks, from our relationships, is that there's a, there's a loud and very persistent clamor for ideas as to how organizations can benefit from accelerating the pace of change afforded by them from all this disruption. In a way, we've been given a platform to change, to reinvent and to innovate how our organizations reshape service in the coming months and years. And these are just some of the things that the CCA network has focused on through its groundbreaking future scenario work that started earlier this year. And we will be covering this in our session on the 22nd of September, so please do look out for that. We know there's a range of critical decisions businesses need to make in the short term in order to succeed in the long term. And the Scenarios program is there to provide the very, very best insight by collaborating with leading brands in private and in public sectors. So please get in touch with the team if you'd like to do more. We believe it's never been more important to have the right insights and the right connections to help us make these far-reaching decisions. So to take you through some of our considerations, I'm now delighted to introduce you to our guest speaker, Daniel Old from OmniTouch International. So just to let you know a little bit about Daniel. Daniel founded OmniTouch 20 years ago and has delivered a variety of workshops across more than 40 countries and dozens and dozens of industries. He's an industry leader in contact centers and customer service with 30 years of management, consulting, and training in centers around the world. Daniel's also a lecturer in Hochschule Fresenius in Germany, where he develops and delivers CX courseware for MBA students. And just before Daniel kicks off, I'd also like to say a huge thanks to today's session sponsor and one of CCA's platinum partners, Ring Central. And you'll be hearing more from Ring Central with Amanda during uh, Daniel's presentation. So. I'm going to pass you over to Daniel. Please do pop any questions that you may have into the chat, and we'll do our best to cover as many of those as we've got time for at the end. And if we don't have question, if we don't have time to cover everything at the end, we'll certainly write back out to everybody who's asked the question and answer it as fully as we possibly can. So over to you, Daniel, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Kevin. It's so nice to be here. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Contact Center Industry Reset. And I'd like to thank the CCA Global folks for having us today. So, Kevin, you did such a nice introduction. Thank you very much. Yeah, we, we travel all over for 20 years teaching this kind of stuff. Um, the company has also conducted about 20 years of mystery shopper research with a big focus in contact centers. So in today's talk, I'm gonna share some very specific examples of things we've learned from client mystery shopper programs and how that can apply to the topic for today. I'd also like to introduce my colleague, Marcus. Marcus, if you don't mind waving, 
who's here with me today, always here with me online, and Marcus will help monitor the chat room for us as we go. So Marcus, thanks again. All righty, just a wee bit of housekeeping. The chat function is open, it's there for you to use. I will specifically ask you at a couple points in the talk today to share your answers. So I'll make that clear and we'll give you time to input your answers then. And along with Kevin, let me also thank Ring Central for making this possible and for also presenting a little bit later uh, today. So let's get to work. The universe keeps sending me this message. Can I ask you to take a look? Now, I think this echoes a little bit of what I heard Kevin say. This is what I've been hearing clients say over the last three to four years, but especially over the last 18 months or so. And I'm a big fan of that very last line. Do our current ways of working work anymore? Or let me put this in a different way. Has what has made us successful up to this point, is that going to continue to make us successful going forward? Now, we all know that the pandemic accelerated the digital world. There's no question. We read about that. We see that everywhere. But I think there's another thing that's been accelerated by the pandemic, and that's questions around how can we measurably make the lives of employees and customers better? So today, I'd like to share three ideas with you specifically on how to make the lives of employees and customers better. So here we go. Let's get to work. The very first idea is this one, and I'd like to start this one off with a question. Can our folks describe what kind of experience we deliver around here? Now, when I use the term folks, let's substitute contact center agents, your frontline folks. Would they be able to answer this question? If I were to walk into your center and say, hey, what kind of experience do you guys deliver around here? What would they say? Um, in some cases, they look at me blankly, okay. In other cases, they might say, well, Dan, we always say the customer's name three times. Okay, sure. Um, now and then someone will say, well, we believe in empathy around here. This can be hard for people to articulate, but the point is that it shouldn't be. And I always use this picture of the ice cream. And let me explain why. Because if you go into an ice cream shop, you're going to get 99 different flavors of ice cream. So when you go up to the counter and you say, hey, I'd like to have mocha almond fudge, no one's going to mix that up with vanilla strawberry ripple. It's very clear that mocha almond fudge is different than strawberry ripple or whatever flavor you're after. And the experience you deliver is exactly the same. It comes in many flavors. And any center, any customer service department should be able to describe that with a level of clarity. And I, I ask myself this question, if we can get this specific with flavors of ice cream, why can't we get specific with the kind of experience we deliver around here? So I think your frontline folks have a challenge. Let me give you a moment to read this. And I think it's a perfectly fair challenge. You'll say, Dan, I don't know how to describe this. I don't know what it's supposed to look like. I don't even know how to bring it to life in my job. So it's always a senior level responsibility to address this challenge. And what I'd like to do now is give you two very specific examples of clients we work with who worked to address that particular challenge so that the people working in their customer service function or their contact center function, were able to describe the kind of experience they deliver around here. Let's do the first one now. Here we go. I've worked with the Singapore government for many, many years. And in fact, we were their official mystery shopper provider for the government, which basically meant that we assessed telephone calls, emails, and face-to-face -face interactions across all Singapore's public sector agencies. And did you know that the Singapore government has what they call a no wrong door policy? In fact, I think it's the only country in the world that has a no wrong door policy. And let me explain what that means. If you call the tax authority about a housing matter question, the tax authority is not gonna say, oh no, you've reached the wrong place. Where are the tax people? You have to call the housing authority people. No, 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 no. What they're going to do is give you concierge style service. And let me explain what that looks like and what that sounds like. They're going to say, oh, actually, you've reached the tax authority, but let me help you. I can either direct you now over to the housing authority, or I can have my colleague from the housing authority contact you back. 
I mean, that's incredible. Because about 10 years ago, even more than 10 years ago, the prime minister's office in Singapore sat down and said, you know what? Any citizen or resident of this country should have no trouble accessing public sector service. Now we have more than 99 agencies. We can't expect citizens to know which agency to go, for, uh, go to for which kinds of questions. So we're gonna make life easier for them. We're gonna implement the no wrong door policy. I mean, that's just incredible. And they take this so seriously, they mystery shop it every single year across all the public sector servants in Singapore. Now, I'm American, you might be able to tell by my accent. I think sometimes when I have to reach out for help in the US, it feels like every door is the wrong door. I contact here and I'm told, no, 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 you reached the wrong place, you have to go here. I get pushed all around. And to be honest, that's very stressful and very pressurizing and very unpleasant. So I love this idea of no wrong door. And here, I've got a couple of questions I always ask myself here. The first is this, if an entire government can do this, and there's 150,000 public sector employees, why can't a private company, why can't a bank do this, or an insurance company, or a travel company, why can't they do this? No wrong door just strikes me as so amazing. The second thing is this, no wrong door is just a written policy. It's just an SOP. What makes so, uh, no wrong door or any policy so powerful is that the people working there actually bring it to life through their actions. So I thought that that was such an interesting example of describing the kind of experience we deliver around here. We never give our customers a wrong door. That's my first example. Let me go to my second example. And the second example is a totally different industry. It's the five-star hotel. So the general manager of a five-star hotel called us up and said, Dan, we've heard about you guys and we'd like you to do a mystery shopper for us. So we said, okay, cool, tell us more. And he said, well, look, we don't really need you to come in and tell us if the front desk people smile or if the food tastes good because we have a management team. Our management team does that, which by the way is very advanced thinking. I love the conversation already. He continued and he said, here's what we did. Last year, we sat down and we came up with seven core values that we think are meaningful for our guests and meaningful for our employees, seven. And after we selected those seven, we've spent the last year training them and teaching them and letting everybody in the hotel know how to bring those to life in their jobs. So what we would like you to do is come up with a mystery shopper program that tests whether our values are in action. It's one thing for us to talk about it, but it's another thing to see that our guests and other employees are actually feeling it. Let me give an example of one value we tested and how we tested it. They had one value they called take ownership. By the way, that's a very common value we see in different companies. We want our people and our organization to take ownership. So we hired a bunch of mystery shoppers. They stayed in the hotel. We spread them out over a few months. You never do this all at one time. And we said, guys, here's what we'd like you to do. In the morning, when you go down to the breakfast restaurant, the host or hostess is gonna come up and ask to seat you. We want you to tell that host or hostess your pillows were lumpy. Tell them your pillows were lumpy. Now, that's a weird request, right? That seems so strange. But can you guess what happened for every single one of our mystery shoppers by the time they finished their breakfast and they've gotten back to their room? Now, if you wanna pop it in and chat, feel free, but just think it through. What happened with every single mystery shopper who said, my pillows are lumpy to a, to a host or hostess? And if you said the pillows had been changed, you were 100% right. Because in every single instance, over a period of about three months, every time the mystery shopper asked that question, the pillows had been changed by the time they got back to the room. Now that is really powerful because obviously what the host or hostess did is they worked through all the back channels of the organization to make sure that the guest request was taken care of. It was almost transparent to the guest that this was all being done. Let me give a second example we used to test this take ownership. We told the mystery shopper, go by the front desk at about noon. Stop by the front desk and say to them, hey, look, I've got to rush out to a business meeting, but when I get back to my room at two, can you have a Wagyu beef burger waiting for me? Now, obviously at a lot of hotels, if you order room service at the front desk, they're gonna push you away. They're gonna push you over to the phones and say you can order over there. But not at this hotel, because they believed in taking ownership. 
So can you guess, and it's not a hard answer here, what happened for every single one of our mystery shoppers by the time they got back to their room? I'll give you a moment to just think about what that looks like in your head. There you go. Our mystery shoppers came back about 2 or 2.05 in the afternoon. Not only did they all have beef burgers waiting for them, they had a handwritten note from the front desk that said, we hope you had a successful meeting. Wow. Now we tested seven values, multiple scenarios. So in all, there were about 38 different scenarios that were tested. And we were sitting down with the GM and board of directors and presenting the results. And we were telling them all the kinds of stories I'm sharing with you now. Everything was good, everything was amazing. And the GM actually said, Dan, it's, it's great to hear all these cool stories, but what can we do to get better? And I actually said, you know, sir, nothing. There's nothing you can do to get better. As a matter of fact, I have to resign your account and not take your money anymore. Because let me tell you what you've done and what everyone is trying to do. First off, you picked values or behaviors that are meaningful and relevant for your place. You pick seven, it could be four, it could be five. You pick seven. The second thing you did is you spent real time teaching people what those values meant, what they look like in their job, how to bring them to life. And then sir, and all of you, I have to say the thing that's most amazing to people like Marcus and I is, your people are bringing this to life in their actions. The way the, the housekeeping department is working with the food and beverage department is working with the reservations department, that's incredible because again, these people are bringing this all to life. And folks, I think it's really important as we look at this reset discussion to realize a lot of companies are looking back at this and saying, huh, some people call it, call it going back to basics. But when we use that word basic, let's be clear, basic doesn't mean simple. Choosing values, who are we as an organization? What do customers expect from us? And I think really deciding what kind of experience we're going to deliver around here. This hotel has always been an inspirational example for me. Let's go to our second topic. The first topic was a bit on this values and experience discussion. What I'd like to do now is go to metrics. Have a look at this question. Now I'm going to get very contact center oriented here because one way to make customers and employees' lives better is to use the right metrics to measure agent performance. So let's dig a little bit more deeply into this. I think there are three things everyone wants from their contact center agent. You want and need their productivity. I call that P. You want and need their quality. I call that Q. Yeah. And you want and need their attitudes. By the way, you'll notice I put attitudes in plural because there's a subset or a set of attitudes agents need to succeed. And I sum it all up as P, Q, and A. Now P and Q are very measurable. You can measure productivity, you can measure quality. Attitudes a bit more difficult to measure. We're gonna put that one to the side for today, but I did wanna mention it. What I'd like to do is jump into productivity. So let me tell you what you're looking at here. You're looking at a productivity performance chart for a contact center team for a month. Now, obviously there are a lot of people on this team. You can see their names listed down the left-hand side of the chart. Now, I'm a big fan that at the end of every month, I give every single agent that works for me a productivity score. By the way, the higher the score, the better, the lower the score, the worse. So let me ask you a question just to be sure we're reading the chart okay. Which agents did well in productivity in this month? So just think it through, or if you like to drop it in the chat, feel free. But who did well in productivity for this month? I'll be quiet a second. And if you said Emma and Dee and Linda, you're right, because the longer the blue bar, the higher the productivity. So which agent struggled with productivity this month? Who didn't do so well? For whatever reason, by the way, this chart's not a root cause chart. We don't know why they're not doing so well or why they're doing well. We can just see what the score is. And if you said people like Sam and Ann and Jan, you're reading the chart correctly. Um, I just want to show you something interesting and that a lot of our clients do when they create productivity scores or charts. I put the potential here. 
Currently, we have 15 agents. I tabulated up their scores, and our productivity score for this month is 247. But if my agents were working much closer to what Linda is achieving, and Linda's my star this month for productivity, my possible high score would be 348, which means I've got a 40% potential productivity gain sitting on the table. And I just want to ask you a management question to think about here. If you were the customer experience director or the VP of service quality in your company, and you were going to look at this diagram for a contact center team for that month, would you say this is a good productivity performance for the team for the month or not a good productivity performance for the team? Can I let you think about that for a moment? By the way, it's a yes, no question. There's no maybe here. And the simple answer is no, this is not a very good productivity performance for a team. Because in a team where the team leader or team manager is constantly communicating productivity, you're going to see people operating much more closely together. This picture shows you way too much variation. And this much variation is rarely a good sign. There's something very strange going on here. Now, here we go. I want to turn this over to you in the next two to three minutes and, or two minutes or so, Marcus will help me out here. It's important to understand what do you think we should be measuring agents on for productivity. Now, let me explain for a moment why I use the basket. We typically recommend with clients or most of our clients use a basket of productivity KPIs, which means it's not just one thing. Sometimes it's two things or three things. What's important to realize about the basket is sometimes one thing is a higher weight and the other two have a lower weight. For today's session, we don't worry about the weightage. I'm just curious, what things should we be measuring agents on for productivity? One last caution before you start popping your answers into chat. We're gonna talk about quality next. So let's not mix productivity and quality together, they're separate. So what would you measure agents on in an inbound contact center environment, whereby you could give them a score at the end of the month and say, hey, Albert, you're a nine. Cindy, you're a six. Uh, Thomas, you're a seven. What would be the basis for that score? So Marcus, I'm gonna be quiet, let you do what you do yeah. so well. <laughs> so, and by the way, guys, please never worry about being right or wrong. You're not gonna be called out. We're not gonna, you know, it, it's just, a chance to express what you are you currently measuring for productivity performance. <clears throat> and this is always interesting, isn't it, Marcus? We, we ask this question quite often in our work, probably yes, once yes. or twice a month, so depending on who we're working with, so. Yeah, we are looking for some feedback. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Nothing it's coming okay. in right now. No worries, it's, I, by the way, that's, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. We got the first one, every attending time. Okay, someone said, no worries. By the way, we're not saying yes or no here. We're not judging. We're just gonna see what pops in. And we thank that person, whoever they are, for starting this off. We have the speed of answer. Okay. I'm jotting these down. We have number of transactions handled and AHT. Okay. So already you can see we've had four different ones entirely, four completely different ones. No problem. We get, I'm curious. We'll carry on a bit. Give you more time. Someone gave an interesting answer. I wouldn't uh, give the score on productivity. Okay. And we have customer experience, for example, NPS or CSAT. Just so you're aware, NPS and CSAT would typically fall under the quality. So hold on to those thoughts for the next set of questions. Here we're focused on what we call the productivity point of view. But you're, you're, you're smart to think ahead on quality. No issues. Hold on to your NPS and CSAT. So we have first time resolution, every handling time. 
number of cases order uh, depending on task and activity. Okay, so Marcus, purely in the interest of time, although we could definitely normally carry this out for a long time, here we go. In the inbound contact center environment, handling what are called service level based contacts. Now service level based contacts are things like phone calls, chats, um, even walk-ins. These are the contacts you handle straight away. The number one measure of productivity for an agent is adherence to schedule. It is adherence to schedule. That is the one with the biggest weight. Average handling time is often included in the basket for those of you that put it, but at a much lower weightage. That is not a majorly weighted KPI. By the way, number of transaction handled is never appropriate in the inbound service environment. So targeting people on let's say number of calls or number of chats is not appropriate. So it's always interesting to see, oh my gosh, even if you chose not to give a productivity score, you still need to be doing these calculations. Believe me, you still need to be presenting this and saying, guys, this is why we're able to meet service level or not meet service level. We need to improve productivity in our center so that we can achieve this. Again, whether you decide to give that to the agent or not is probably a different discussion, but you're still going to measure it. So I think I'll say this. One of the biggest challenges I see in contact centers and have for 20 years is this lack of clarity sometimes. That's probably the best way to say it around what comprises productivity in the contact center environment. So we've done P. We've done P and we're sticking with adherence to schedule as the big one, as the big one. Now, let's take a look at the second score we give to our agents, because I like their P and their Q. I want productivity and quality. Now, this is a diagram for the same team for the same, same month, but now we're not looking at productivity, we're looking at quality. And I think you all know how to read this now. The higher the blue bar, the better the quality, the lower the blue bar, the lower the quality. So again, you can see that Linda, Keith, and Anne did very well in quality that month, whereas Sam and Connie and Lori, they didn't do so well with quality that month. And again, I look at my potential because currently on average, my agents are operating at 7.3, but my possible high score is 9.5. So any senior person's gonna look at this and say, Dan, there's a 30% quality gain sitting on the table. What can we do to get that? Now, a couple of questions. First one is, as you look at this picture, and I asked this question last time, would you say the team leader or team manager here is doing a good job of managing quality in the team? Purely based on the diagram you see here. So stop and think about it. If you wanna answer in chat, feel free, but it's not required. It's totally up to you. But is our team leader, team manager, supervisor, whatever you want to call them, are they doing a good job of managing the queue here? <clears throat> I have a feeling most of you picked up on this and probably from the earlier discussion as well. The answer is no. The answer is no. You have too much variation across the team members. In teams where quality is a regular discussion, regularly discovered and addressed, you're gonna see people much, much closer together. You're always gonna have outliers. You're always gonna have the one or two down here and the one or two up there. That's just the nature of how teams work. But by and large, you're gonna see much more close performance. I have another question specifically related to quality and it's, it's something you're welcome to guess in the chat. What process might help this picture look better? Or let me put it another way. What process might be missing here that's resulting in this wide variation in performance? Because when you talk about quality, there tends to be a very strong process that helps us better manage it. I'm just curious if you wanna guess what that process is. Feel free to use the chat or just put it in your own mind. But I think when I look at Q and I see this kind of performance in a team, I'm like, you know what, I, best, I bet X isn't happening very much here, or X isn't happening, or it is happening, but it's not being very well done, for example. Okay, we have feedback, we have sharing best practice amongst the team. 
I love these answers. And thank you guys for these answers. It means you're, you're engaged, you know? Marcus, we'll wait and see what else pops up. I'm yeah. happy. Continuous improvement cycles. And you know, I'm going to just give give one uh, thought here. What is often missing when you see a quality variation like this is what's called in our industry transaction coaching. There's actually a formal term for it because when you use the term transaction coaching, you're saying I'm coaching to your call, I'm coaching to your email, I'm coaching to your chat, I'm coaching to your transaction. If you don't like the word transaction, some people don't. You can call it interaction coaching. But what's often missing is either a very weak QA process or just this regular ongoing transaction coaching that kind of gets everybody on the same page. Yeah, and now, we have some interesting input for that. So I'm ready. We have yeah. coaching and allowing the team to listen to each other's calls for calibration. Yeah. So perfect. You know, see the ideas out there to do this kind of thing are so great, guys. So again, if you look at your team's Q performance and you're using these kinds of tactics and approaches, you're going to see much closer performance than you see here. So now I did want to give you the same question I gave you when we talked about productivity, which is this. And by the way, some of you already answered it. So if you answered it already, please come back and visit us. What are the metrics you use or centers use to quantify agent quality performance for me? to say, Cindy, this month you're an eight. Tanya, you're a six. Uh, Mark, you're a 4.3. What are the metrics or inputs? But here, feel free to pop in the chat. Because now we're looking at Q. We're not looking at P. It's a different discussion. We have C sets. Very good. Knowledge. Thank you. Go ahead, Marcus. Sorry. NPS scores, C set scores, complaints as a number or percentage of calls. Yeah, I mean, it sounds to me like you guys have the right idea here. I'm, I'm not hearing one thing, though. Maybe I missed it. You're giving me some great what's called VOC stuff, voice of customer stuff, the stuff that's coming from the voice of the customer. I think there's another potential input here. I know you know it. I'll just wait for so it. We comment. have first call resolution, NPS, CSET, and coaching scorecards. Ah, uh, okay. Whoever put coaching scorecards, I think you picked up the other thing that I was looking for, which is the internal measurements. And just very, very quickly, let me share with you what some of our global clients have told us. They said, Dan, when we first started doing Q measurements, like you're describing here, 100% of the score was based on internal uh, scorecards, et cetera. But we realized sometimes that the scores on the scorecards were really high, but customers still weren't happy. So we sat down and we switched. We went entirely the other way. True stories, you can't make this stuff up. We went 100% to survey results. But here's what we found. When the agent Q score was 100% VOC, guess what happened? They did anything the customer wanted, anything they wanted the customer got because the agent wanted the high Q score, which kind of makes sense. So we realized they were kind of giving away the farm in some examples. So what they switched to, and I'm only describing, I'm not prescribing, but I think it's an interesting mindset, is now we use 50% internal score as one of the items in our basket and 50% external score to put into the basket. And that way we have more of a balance between internally those behaviors we know are important, but customers may not salute. And then of course, we're still keeping customers happy through the VOC. So I think when I hear things like NPS, CSAT, that kind of thing, it's VOC. When I hear first call resolution or scorecards, then I'm looking at the internal measures. Isn't that interesting? All right, guys, let's pull it all together. Marcus, we're good or you have another comment you wanna throw at me? Nope, you can continue. Okay. Well, you knew. How can you be a consultant and not use a two by two matrix? It's against the law. But I find this one very powerful. Let me show you how to read it. On the vertical axis here, you see productivity. So here's high productivity up here, low productivity down there. 
And on the horizontal axis, you've got quality. Here's low quality over here, high quality off to the right. At the end of every month, I give my agent a P score and a Q score so that I can plot them. Because the reality is I can ask for both. As long as I set metrics that do not fight each other or compete with each other, I can ask for P and I can ask for Q. So let's just quickly look at these clusters. In this cluster, we have high P, high productivity. We have lower Q. Can I just quickly tell you, without even knowing who these people are, what's going on here? When I see high productivity, these people come in on time, they come back from lunch on time, they aren't late in the morning, they don't call in sick every Monday, they're turning up on time. We have to have the right number of people in the right place to achieve service level. But for whatever reasons, their quality isn't so great. Sometimes these are newbies, people that we hire new are quite good about being on time, but maybe not so good yet at the quality. Let me go to this bottom right-hand quadrant here. These people have high Q, but they have low P. So let me just give you a moment to think about. So what does that mean? If you had to explain this to someone, what would, that, what would it sound like? Just take a moment, think about it in your minds. High Q, so that means that they're 50% internal Q quality score from QA and their 50% VOC is good, or maybe you do 100% internal quality score is good. But when you hear someone's productivity is low, they're good when they decide to come to work. They're good when they decide to turn up. They come back from lunch an hour late. They leave early. They're calling sick every Monday. Yeah, they're good when they turn up, but oh, we're not gonna be able to achieve our service level. By the way, I don't know why there are so many people down here in the bottom left. I mean, that's low P, low Q. And I should probably explain, I did not make this chart. We had a client in Korea go through our operations course. They went back, they put it together, they started applying it, and she sent this to me. Now what they did, and you can see all the Korean names below, is they said, we post this publicly in our center because we want everyone to know how our teams are performing. But we obviously don't want to embarrass people. So they're using a different colored bubble for each agent to represent that agent's name. Now, again, your decision on what you make public and don't make public is part of your culture. That's not my place to say. But increasingly, I am seeing people look at a picture like this and say, yeah, Dan, it kind of makes sense. So who do, we, who do we really rely on here? Well, there they are. These people give us high P and they give us high Q. And I'm about to act out the job of a team leader. Can I tell you what the job of a team leader is? You ready? Here you go. Now, obviously, sound effects are optional. Your entire job as a team leader is to take these people and move them to the higher quadrant. Everybody is different. So what's holding this bubble back, you're gonna to have to help that person. What's holding this bubble back, what's holding this bubble back. But that's what team leaders do. And I've even seen the P and Q model used in this way. They'll post up June's results and then July will come. They'll put July on top of June and they'll put little red lines to show each agent, look how far you've come. You went from here to here. By September, we'll move you to here. So there's a sense that people are progressing and growing. So that is the concept of P and Q. And I want to say this, this conversation is about a contact center reset, which is now is a chance, not just the digital stuff, although that matters. This is a chance to make employees and customers lives better. And one of the best ways to do that in the contact center environment is measure people on the right things measure people on the right things, and then you get people put into the right direction. You get the right kinds of outcomes. Now, with that said, we are now ready to hear from the folks at Ring Central. I think Amanda here has a very interesting discussion. We take about 10 minutes on speech analytics. So I'm going to turn over, and Amanda, thank you very much, and we'll let you do your toggling back and forth. And after Amanda's done, We'll, I'll come back and we'll do one last topic together, so. Okay, thanks, Daniel. Um, I don't appear to be able to share my screen. If you could stop. Oh, I, let me stop sharing. Hold on, Amanda, it could be me. Let yeah. me stop. Yeah, there you go.
Sorry about that. Thank you. There, can everybody see that? Yes. yes. Yeah. Right. So my name is Mont Henderson and I am a solutions engineer at Ring Central. My area of expertise is contact centre. So what I'm going to do today is run you through one of our digital contact centre products. The product that we're going to have a look at is interaction analytics. And this is one of my favourite products of the WFO suite. Interaction analytics is a speech analytics tool. So we're taking that spoken voice and we're monitoring that voice for trends, for sentiment trends. We're looking at frustration, but we've also categorized our brand in our keywords, in our sentiment. So we're, we're category tracking as well. The way that this works is that it takes the spoken voice and it transcribes it into text. It also analyzes the content of our email and our um, web chat as well, because we're in that digital workspace when we're answering more than one channel. So on the back of that, what it produces is these wonderful dashboards that you can see on the screen in front of you. And these are widget based dashboards so you can customize them to display the data that you want. If you compare these to the traditional contact center wallboard, as it was in my day, um, we're now looking at displaying different information rather than just the standard ACD metrics like how many calls you've answered, or what your service level is, and most importantly, what was in the queue. And sometimes having those metrics constantly on display can actually be a little bit demotivational for the agents if all that they see is a negative service level and a queue that they know that they'll never get to the end of. So what we're looking at now is, you know, what's happening right now in the contact center and it's given agents that insight, but it's also given managers the insight into what customers are talking about. This is real time. So if we have a look at this widget here at the top, this is now trending sentiment in our contact center. How happy are our customers? And currently we're trending 23% positive and 13% negative, but we can trend both sides. We want happy agents because happy agents means happy customers. So I can change this view and say, right, I'm trending 23% of my customers. How are my agents today? And you can see that widget has updated and we're now trending 30% positive on an agent side of the conversation. So I know as a manager that my agents are actually happier than my customers. I think I prefer a bit of a better balance, but on the whole, positive is overriding negative right now. And this will update real time throughout the day. So if all of a sudden I see this negative starting to trend, I need to be able to find out what's happening. So if we just move down now onto the next widget, this is what people are talking about. So it's categorizing positive, negative, neutral, and mixed sentiment. And you can see it just updated there. This is real time. So I can separate this by sentiment type. So I can see my positive, negative, and mixed sentiment. If I all of a sudden looked at this and it started to go red, and the bubbles actually represent the number of interactions. And I started to see bigger bubbles appearing on this screen. I can actually drill down and find out what's causing this negativity. Rather than having to listen into calls, um, see call spikes, judge the mood of the contact center, I can actually get that insight almost instantly. So I can have a look at the negative interactions. So I clicked on break. It's now going to pull up for me all of the interactions that have that word in. So I can see here, it's the majority of them appear to be voice calls. We've got a lot of negative sentiment and it's coming from a customer side, not an agent side. And then I can start to look at the individual interactions. And it's going to trend for me. So this is a voice conversation that has been translated into text. 
I've also got the player there as well. But throughout the voice conversation, all of my keywords that I've categorized will be highlighted. You can see them there. And this color code here, trends, whether it's positive, negative, um, anything in between will be neutral or mixed. So I can pick out the keywords to see exactly why this conversation has been classed as negative. I can even listen to the conversation as well. We can see that the customer there and the, the agent is a two-sided conversation. So that enables me to find out exactly what's happening. So for an example, it could be that there has been a delay in us updating customer accounts. I see accounts on my dashboard, click on it, and I can instantly see that we've got an IT issue. Accounts have not been updated. Can I do something about it? Let's just go back to my dashboard. So that's sort of like a real-time view of sentiment, what's happening right now in the contact center and how you can react and view those contacts, those interactions uh, about what's happening right now. But we can also look at our keywords. Again, this is another really visual word cloud. The keywords, this is what people are talking about today. We can have a look at our top categories. And these, these are what we pre-configured in the platform that we're tracking. So at the moment where suggestions and customer service feedback seem to be the highest categories. But most importantly, and this is what I think is really interesting about this product, we can trend frustration and sentiment over a period of time. So we can start to build up pictures. We can then start to investigate why we've had such a spike in frustration or a trend in sentiment. And we can drill down again. We've got these wonderful graphs here. All this information could maybe be exported as well into other tools like Power BI or Tableau. But from this, we can see that we've got a repetitive spike that happens at the same time as frustration every day. If I drill down on this, it's going to tell me that my agents are getting frustrated towards 7 p.m. every night. Why is that? Is it their shifts are too long? Do we really need to give them some more offer time? Are they frustrated because they don't have the correct skills to be able to do their job? So I can listen to these interactions now and find out exactly why we're seeing this negativity and this frustration. But from an agent point of view, I think we need to be able to, to drill down and be able to give our agents the correct tools to be able to do their jobs, but also monitor them to make sure that they're not feeling that frustration, that it's not having a negative impact on them. So we can measure our frustrated interactions with agents. And frustration normally is a negative term, but what I'd like to know is why are my agents being so frustrated? So if we have a look here, these are my agents, these are their scores. Chris, unfortunately, seems to be a very frustrated agent. I'm going to have a look at his interactions because to me this is a red flag. Instantly, I can see exactly what the problem is here. Chris, all his frustrated interactions are email. Is it that he hasn't had the correct soft skills training? to be able to deal with these emails effectively. He's frustrated. He doesn't know what answers to give. Chris is quite an old school agent. He likes to sit and talk to advisors, sorry, to customers. That is where his skill set is. So me, as a manager, I can instantly identify that Chris is struggling with emails. Is this a training issue, potentially? Or should I hone in on his skills? He's better at a voice agent. Maybe take this channel away from him and have him concentrate on the channel that he can answer the best. So that is frustration. How you manage it in the contact center and how you can, what that information can give you and how you can manage your agents effectively. There's one more KPI that this package can give you, which I think is really important. And it's something that you probably wouldn't using your traditional monitoring tools, be able to capture very effectively. But this is the interaction of silence. Nobody likes silence 
when they're ringing up to resolve a query. It's very unnerving. You don't know whether you've been cut off. You don't know whether the agent's talking about you to somebody else. Why have you been put on hold? So this tool measures the interaction of silence across your voice and across your chat channels, the real-time channels, real-time digital channels. So you can see here we're trending at 19% voice. So 19% of our voice phone calls are silent. Why is that? 35% of our chat is silent. So instantly for me, I would start looking at the chat to find out why we've got such a high percentage and we've got one there and it will let me bring up the chat transcript to be able to have a look at that. So what I can do now is I can have a look at this agent and go right at your trending a really high chat silence rate but when I look your profile is set up for you to handle 15 simultaneous chats that is excessive and clearly it's not working because we're having that high silence percentage so me as a manager i would change that profile so the agent handles less simultaneous chat so there's less silence in the chat conversations again with voice i can drill down and i can identify which calls have that high percentage of silence and we've got teresa there And I can see her conversation. And it's going to measure the silence in that conversation. And I can look at this and go, right, is she constantly putting the customer on hold? Is it a training issue? I can actually listen to the conversation and find out why she's putting that, that caller on hold or why there was silence. And I think as if I was a contact centre manager, this is something that I would set some really strong KPIs around. So we're, what percentage of silence is acceptable, what is not, and we can now start to monitor this on a global as a contact centre, but we can actually drill it down on a per agent basis as well. So that was a very brief overview of our interaction analytics product. If you've got any questions, please pop them in the chat and I'll try and answer them as we go on. And Thank I'll you very much, button. Amanda. No problem. Give me two seconds here and I will bring back our final topic. By the way, for me, that, that aligns beautifully with this discussion on what can we do to measurably make the lives of customers and employees better. So thanks again, Amanda, for that. Alrighty, guys, so I know we only have a few minutes left. That's okay. This is a shorter or third and last topic for today is culture. And what I'm showing you on the screen is my favorite definition of culture. It's the one I use when I teach CX. I'll give you a moment to have a look at this. So let me tell you why I like this definition so much, because it includes the word success. What do I need to do to succeed around here? Because by and large, when people join a company or work at a company, they want to fit in, they want to be successful. Now, what I'm showing you here are some cultural beliefs. Um, another word for beliefs could be assumptions, but I like the word beliefs. And here are two examples of cultural beliefs I experienced with clients prior to the pandemic. Read the first one and see if, you, if, it, if it makes you smile. So I think this was November 2019, so just months before the pandemic, we were working with the bank and the bank directors flat out told us, we don't believe people who work from home are as productive as people who work in an office. Therefore, we will have a zero work at home program in particular for contact center agents. And there's a second one there. Some, some companies, it's you just have this feeling you learn to succeed around here. It's best to understand that whatever the boss says, we go with, even if we think that's wrong. I think what's interesting to me about cultural beliefs, and obviously you can have many, 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 is they can be very strongly held. They are very deeply held. People get very passionate about these statements. But when you look at them, there's actually no proof. 
I mean, look at the top one. If you ask someone or people at home who work at home as productive as people who work in an office, you're going to get 52 different kinds of answers. So that's what's interesting about cultural beliefs. The real question is, are the beliefs that we have around here helping us get to where we want to go? Are they holding us back? By the way, another way I think of culture is this. What does a new hire see or hear in their first weeks and months on the job? So look at it this way. You hire a new contact center agent. Let's say we're back to being in the office just to make the example easy. The old experienced contact center agent leads over and says, hey, let me tell you what you need to do. They talk a lot about quality here, but believe me, they don't care. Productivity, productivity, productivity. That's cultural belief at work. That is what a new hire is hearing and seeing. So again, the question is, are some of these beliefs helping us go forward? Or you can see in the image there, do we need to weed those beliefs out? And the last thing I want to point out on this slide is, what kinds of things are measured, incentivized, and celebrated around here? I love that. Agents do what is measured, what is incentivized, and what is celebrated. So one of the reasons I like doing the PNQ is that's a very clear description of what's measured around here. So in closing for this, and we're looking a little bit at culture in a, in a customer experience context, there are three what are called socialization categories, a ritual, training, or storytelling. And by the way, these categories aren't always black and white. It could be that more than one category applies, but I have three examples and I'd like you to guess which one is which. So here we go. I'm gonna bring the first one up. Have a read of this, and then you decide, is this an example of a ritual, of training, or of storytelling? And just in the interest of time, the answer is, although I love when you use the that guys oh it makes me happy this is a ritual this exactly. is a ritual yeah and whoever put it i bow down to you if i had anything to give you more than respect i would <laughs> anything that happens on a regular basis or triggered by an event is a ritual and rituals can be very powerful can i ask you to stop a second and ask yourselves why does abc software company do this because this is a real case study they really do this why would they do this what is the message they're trying to send to the employees. I'll give you a moment to think about it. <clears throat> and if you talk to the software company, they're gonna tell you something like, well, Dan, here's what we do. We say to our colleagues and our staff and our employees, version 2.3.2 lived a long and useful life. It made customers happy up to this point but it's not gonna keep them happy going forward. So today we honor and bury version 2.1.3 or whoever died, and now we're going to version 3.6.2. So it's an interesting way to celebrate the new innovations they're coming up with. I have a yeah, second. We have some input here. I'm ready, Marcus, yeah, yeah, go, yeah. It's gone, move on to the new, embrace it. <laughs> yeah, that's our innovation person who gave that answer, Marcus. So, and again, yes. if you hear me speeding up my talking time, it's just so that I can let you all have lunch on time. But thank you for that. That made me smile. All right. The second one. We have three. Here's your second one. Is this an example of a ritual for culture building, training for culture building, or storytelling for culture building? And again, sometimes it can be a Feels like a blend, so. Storytelling. I don't mind hearing the answers at all, Marcus. Wow, some people type very fast, yeah. There's a clue here that gives it away what it is primarily. There's a clue, and I know you'll pick it up. They spend, what, one day a month. The moment you hear one day a month, every week, every morning, every time we have a new software. You're dealing with a ritual, but this is a ritual that could involve customers telling their story. So I promise I'm not being difficult here. I promise I'm not being a bossy old grump here. I just kind of want to set the sense that this is a ritual and sure enough, customers that come in may tell their story. By the way, this is a Middle Eastern bank. The last one, 
the last one for today. Is this an example of rituals, training, or storytelling? <clears throat> By the way, I'm a huge fan of contact libraries, call libraries, chat libraries, email libraries, where you have good examples and, and poor examples. And the answer here is this is a classic training initiative. We make this available to our agents. I heard some of you say this earlier so that they can go and listen to good and not so good examples. I guess my point here is I had to remember when I was running centers, never underestimate the power of rituals and storytelling. I think training was pretty well understood, but this idea of what are we celebrating around here and why and what kind of storytelling practices can we bring into the center to help agents understand the lives of customers better, or senior, or senior managers for that matter. So guys, we've come to the end. We, we talked about a time for a reset here. My focus on the reset was making the lives of employees and customers better. So we had vision and values. We did PQ&A. Now you all know what PQ&A stands for. And we did a bit of culture by looking at three aspects of socialization. And so I just want to say thank you again to the CCA Global and obviously to Ring Central as well. And turn back over to you, Kevin. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. That was, uh, and thank you, Marcus and Amanda as well. Um, there is so much in there that we could be spending <laughs> just working through and debating and, uh, and, and telling our own stories uh, to uh, help us really understand all of that. But we're out of time, unfortunately. So um, I'm going to thank everybody. I'm going to thank all of our members who joined the session. Uh, it has been recorded, as I mentioned earlier, so we will circulate the link afterwards. And with that, let's... Uh, close up and everybody can enjoy lunch and the rest of the day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody.